Hello, this is Let's Talk About Myths, baby, and I'm your host, Liv. Here I am again, talking about Euripides, because honestly, is there anything better in this world than Euripides' plays? Maybe the Odyssey, but that is it. I am so fucking excited to be sharing this play with you. It's like every time I find a new Euripides play that I haven't read yet, it's more interesting and unique than the last one, which is pretty hard given that the last play of his that I covered was the Alcestis. Whew. The Helen might not be secretly wildly hilarious, but it is deeply fascinating and, oh, I won't even give it away. There's, there's more there. Also ghosts, kind of. I will just never get over the women characters that Euripides gives us. Women with thoughts and feelings and opinions, human emotions and intentions. They're just real people. I shouldn't be this impressed, but it's a low bar. A wacky concept, I know. This Helen is suddenly sympathetic. She is without fault in the Trojan War, even the nonsense faults placed upon her by angry men, that her actions caused the war when in fact she didn't force anyone to go to war for her. But here, even that is gone. This Helen was never in Troy, never taken by Paris. This Helen was snatched up by a god and deposited in a faraway land beyond the Greek world where she's just expected to wait it all out, while an equally divinely inspired ghost, an Eidolon, causes all the trouble. This alone, this use of the Eidolon and the faultless Helen are a complete departure from all depictions of the Trojan War from Euripides' time and before. He comes from a tradition of plays about the war, about Helen, of mythology obsessing over her crimes, her seduction. And then he's just like, okay, but what if we don't blame the woman? What if we develop an entire play around the idea that she did nothing wrong and actually she's cool and smart and loves her husband and it's all the god's fault? Fucking revolutionary. This Helen is human rather than an object, like every single other interpretation of her. But now I'm rambling because I love Euripides. Where did we last leave this piece of art? Euripides is Helen. The woman, Helen, so famous for being in Troy, for the Greeks and Trojans waging a ten-year war over her beauty, isn't in Troy at all. She's in Egypt. And in Troy, all along, there's been a ghost. An Eidolon, standing in her place, convincing the Greeks and the Trojans that she's been there with them. Meanwhile, in Egypt, for a long time, Helen lived fairly comfortably. She was brought there by a god. This is all the will of the gods, all they're doing. She lived under their king, Proteus, and things had been fine. And then he died. Now, under his son, Theoclymenus, things are not fine. Helen is constantly fending him off, avoiding him in fear of him. He wants to marry her. It's not marriage if they don't want it. This poor woman, always at the will of lusty men who can't take no for an answer. And thanks to a visit from the Greek warrior Teucer, Helen knows that not only have her mother and brothers died of their shame and grief over the actions of her Eidolon, not only did the war over her Eidolon go on for ten years, but on top of it all, it's been another seven since the war ended, and, tragically, her beloved husband, Menelaus, has gone missing. With her ghost, her Eidolon. And that's an important distinction when it comes to this Helen, this story. This Helen loves her husband, misses her husband, and just wants to be back with him. And this Menelaus? Well, he's about to be pretty appealing. This is episode 174. That feeling when your ghost Eidolon causes the most famous war in ancient history. 
Euripides' Helen. Helen is in mourning. She's just been told that not only did the Trojan War go on for ten years, all that fighting and death over her, except it wasn't over her at all, but some divinely fake version of her, that not only did it go on for ten years, but it's been another seven since it ended, seven years since it ended, and still no sign of her husband learning her whereabouts, finding her. And to make it all so, so much worse, her mother and her brothers back home are all dead all dead because of their grief over her. All that death and sadness in the name of some ghost version of her, while she's just been forced to sit and wait it out. And now? Now she can't even wait it out in comfort, because the good king Proteus is dead, and his shitty son, Theoclymenus, is in charge. And he wants to marry Helen, whether she wants to or not. Things are not looking good. And so Helen and the chorus sing of their sadness and their grief over the horrors of the gods. Helen reminds the audience and the chorus who is at fault. The gods. She sings of Aphrodite accompanying Paris as he sailed to Sparta on his quest for Helen's beauty. She calls Aphrodite a trickster, a killer. Then she moves on to Hera, the goddess to blame for the ghost of her, the Eidolon. Together, Hera and Aphrodite have teamed up to cause her so, so much sadness. Except, actually, they're each doing it to be better than the other. She continues telling her story, speaking of her life of bad luck, the odd nature of everything to do with her own existence, of her parentage by Zeus being born from an egg, how that makes her not quite Greek and not quite anything else. She says, quote, My whole life's been strange because of Hera and because of beauty. I wish I could go back to being ugly. My beauty wiped away from me like paint. I wish the Greeks forgot my misadventures and only kept good thoughts of me in mind. And then she goes on and on about the gods, how they've caused all of this, how they've punished her, given her this bad luck, physically moved her from her home in Sparta to this foreign land, a land of barbarians, non-Greeks. She says, quote, My fortunes hung upon a single anchor, my husband, who might some day come to save me. But now he's dead and I have no hope. She speaks of her mother's death, her brother's. She sings of her daughter back in Sparta, growing old without her mother there, without her mother to find her a match if anyone would even want her after everything that's happened. She speaks of how, even if she were to find her way home, what the Spartans would do to her if she showed up there without the protection of Menelaus. She'd never be allowed back. They'd bar the gates against her after all that's happened in her name. The way Euripides writes Helen here reminds me of his Medea, a woman whose life is tied to her husband's to such a degree that when something like this happens, Helen believed Menelaus to be dead or Jason leaving Medea, they are ruined. They're unable to make their way on their own. Women like them can't just move on, can't just find another man in Greece, can't just find their own way. Euripides is writing in classical Athens, which was very restrictive when it came to women, and that comes across. But Athenian women aside, these women have everything else against them. Helen is believed to be the cause of a ten years' war that saw the death of the most heroic of Greek men. Medea is a foreigner who burned every one of her bridges at home in order to go off with Jason. Neither woman has anything without these husbands, through little fault of their own. Okay, fine, that applies more to Helen. Medea definitely killed her brother. Still, he's examining these women who are forced to live by the whims of others, and what that would be like, how it would feel to have your fate decided by others, by the will of the gods.
Eventually, the chorus steps in on Helen's grief-filled speech. They try to remind her that it's very possible that the news she received from Tucer isn't all true. It's very possible that he didn't know the fate of Menelaus, that maybe Menelaus is still alive. Helen, though, can't be convinced. She's stuck in her sadness, the grief at learning that her fate's been decided already. They push her, remind her that he could still be alive. They remind her that not everything is bad, that she likes everyone in the Egyptian palace aside from Theoclymenus, that beyond him, she does have friends there. They tell her to go inside and speak to Theoclymenus' sister, Theonoe, who is not only Helen's friend, but also a powerful prophetess and a priestess. She will know Menelaus's fate. Go ask her, they tell Helen. Then you will know for sure, and you can behave accordingly. Weep and grieve, or keep your hope. They add that they wish to go inside with her to hear the news from Theonoe themselves. Quote, Since women always ought to work together. Euripides, I love you. <laughs> they continue to speak. Helen is so broken by the war that's been fought for her, so overwhelmed by the sadness and the guilt of it all being done in her name, even if she was nowhere near the action, had no say in what happened, and couldn't be blamed if anyone knew the truth of the Eidolon. Still, it was all done in her name, and so much blood was spilled. She considers ending it all, especially if Menelaus is indeed dead. If that's true, she can't see any way out. She considers how she could do it, determining that hanging herself is undignified, that she's better than that. Instead, quote, I'll drive the iron inside my flesh to win the game of death, a sacrifice to them, that triple team of goddesses. I wouldn't normally quote so much about suicidal ideation, I'm sorry, but I couldn't let you all live without that line, to win the game of death. The whole thing is too powerful, an indictment of the gods who started all of this. Helen goes on, theorizing about Menelaus' death still, telling the chorus that if she learns that he is definitely dead and gone, she will have to kill herself to end it all. She speaks of the war, and while I really should move this along, I just have to quote more of it to you because it's too good. Quote, Oh, Troy, unhappy city, ruined through deeds that were not done. How terribly you suffered. My gifts from Aphrodite bore so much blood, so much weeping, grief on grief, and pain on pain. And she continues later, quote, the land of Greece cried out and keened with wails and lamentation. They beat their faces and ripped their tender cheeks with fingernails that scraped till they were wet with blood. Euripides is definitely telling us a little something about the horrors of war, and that's not unintentional, or just a side effect of speaking of the Trojan War. This was written very shortly after the famed Sicilian expedition, which did not go well for Athens. Of course, we can't really say for sure whether Euripides is condemning war because of how the Sicilian expedition went for Athens, i.e. that they lost badly, or just because he was anti-war broadly. Still, it's an interesting added piece in a work that already is a commentary on the gods and maybe even the way that Greeks have been viewing Helen for the last few hundred years. As Ash put in their notes on this play, thank you Ash for notes, this is a Helen who is desperate, who is enslaved by her beauty. What I wouldn't give to talk to Euripides to ask him questions about why he wrote what he wrote, my kingdom for a time machine that doesn't break everything. Now, remember, before all of this began, Helen was meant to go inside and speak to Theoclymenus' sister, ask her for a prophecy of her future, gain some insight into what's happened, what will happen, and maybe just how screwed she is or isn't. So finally, after all her lamentation, all the talk of the horror done in her name, in the name of her beauty and her body, she goes inside to speak with Theonoe. And then Menelaus walks on stage... And he's not wearing much. Mm -hmm. 
Menelaus walks on stage wearing very little, rags really torn to shreds by the shipwreck he's just endured, the reason he's washed up, all haggard and torn up, on the shores of Egypt. But he doesn't know where he is, has no idea, actually. He begins with a speech explaining this, telling the audience of who he is and what he's endured. He references his father, Atreus, and his father, Pelops, a less than subtle nod to the curse that hangs heavy on his family. He tells the audience how he's been trying to get home, how he sailed everywhere across the coast of Africa and found no welcome, and that every time he's about to finally sail home, gets far enough north, every time the right winds catch his sails, they blow in the opposite direction and he's pushed away from Greece once more. Never reaching home, never even getting close. And that's when he was finally shipwrecked. Only he and a few others survived the wreck, though one survivor is particularly notable. Can you guess who it is? His wife. Menelaus tells the audience that he and Helen, the woman who caused that awful war in the first place, survived the shipwreck. He goes on to say that he left her in a cave nearby so that he could find out where they are, whether they're in enemy territory or not. He's embarrassed, though, to have to explain who he is when he's looking so shabby, so tired and dirty, so broken down by what he's endured. Finally, he spots someone coming out of the palace. He's eager to speak with them to find out who lives in this fancy, obviously very rich palace that he's stumbled upon. So when an old woman exits the palace and addresses him, he's happy to speak. Kind of. Because, well, this woman immediately tells him to leave because he'll annoy the man who rules the palace and that even worse, if he's Greek, he's sure to die. No Greeks are welcome. They have a kerfuffle, it seems, with Menelaus telling her not to threaten him, not to use fists or shove him, and her replying that it's his fault because he won't leave. He pushes her, asking her to go, just go inside and speak to the ruler of the house. But she cuts him off. It'll be worse if I do. He's clearly not listening to her very clear instruction. If you're Greek, you're not welcome here. In fact, you're completely fucked. You will be killed. And, well, Menelaus is a bit of a dink, frankly. I'm lost, he announces petulantly before adding that he had a very famous army once, to which she replies, quote, Were you important somewhere? Here, you're not. <sighs> which he finds to be quite unfair, quite disrespectful, but again, imagine it petulant. He says that he used to have good luck, to which she replies, quote, Then why not leave? Your friends can watch you cry. Anyway, I love her. Menelaus, though, ignores the jabs and also ignores her very obvious instructions to leave. Instead, he presses for information, asking where he is, whose palace, whose kingdom this is. This is the house of Proteus, she tells him, the kingdom of Egypt. Menelaus isn't thrilled to hear that he's all the way in Egypt. It's not exactly close to home, and he's been trying so damn hard to reach Sparta. She's a bit snippy, though, when he's upset to be in Egypt. Quote, the sparkling Nile. What's wrong with it to you? And I mean, she's not wrong. The Nile is awesome. And I think under normal circumstances, Menelaus would agree. It's just that he'd really like to be home, which is basically what he tells her. Quote, I wasn't criticizing. I'm just sad. <laughs> Again, this Menelaus is a bit of a dweeb so far, but I think we'll come around to him. Still, the immediate juxtaposition of his complaints on his own luck versus Helen's very valid and very righteous laments about her situation is interesting. Obviously, hers is also a matter of luck, but she can speak about it in terms of divine intervention, the actions of the gods and how they've affected her entire life, her entire fate, how it's affected the whole Greek and Trojan worlds. How much needless bloodshed happened, how tragic it all is, the lives lost. Meanwhile, he's like, I'm sad. Still, he's not pulled off his course too long. He asks the woman again about her master, about who rules the palace, the kingdom there in Egypt. She explains that this tomb they're standing near is his, Proteus. Now that he's dead, his son rules the kingdom, and he hates Greeks. Finally, Menelaus asks the important question, why does he hate Greeks? And she answers him, quote, Helen, the child of Zeus, is in this house.
the old woman standing outside Proteus's grave, speaking with a ragged, tired, and broken Menelaus, announces that the reason the king, Theoclymenus, hates Greeks is that Helen is in his house. She what? Menelaus asks her to repeat herself, not believing what he's just heard. She says it again, quote, the child of Tyndareus, the girl from Sparta. I love that in answering this question, she manages to give Helen her two fathers, Zeus and Tyndareus, but it's all the same woman. This is ancient Greece, and everyone would have just been like, yep, that's Helen. Of course, the important part here is the way Menelaus is absolutely reeling from this news. Sorry, what? My wife? Here? He's baffled. He's just left her in a cave, not even hours ago. He says, quote, but when? My, my wife was stolen from the cave? To which the woman replies, without further explanation, that Helen arrived before the Greeks ever arrived in Troy. She won't hear anything more from him. She tells him that he's come at a bad time, there's trouble, and if he's caught there, he will be killed. She's trying to help him. She says that she actually likes Greeks, but she's afraid of Theoclymenus. And there, she finally leaves him leaves him feeling very, very confused. Menelaus is reeling. He begins a speech, trying to talk through what he's just learned, to understand how it could be that this woman believes Helen to be here. What confusion could have taken place for this to occur? He theorizes that the woman staying there in Egypt must be a different Helen, just a woman with the same name? Except, he continues, is there another Zeus who could be her father? Another Sparta there in Egypt? Where this other Helen could be from? Somehow he decides that those are possible, but there's only one Tyndarius. That's the big confusion, which I love. Tyndarius is where you draw the line, but not like Zeus? He just can't fathom it all, can't sort it out in his mind. He says, quote, Is there another country that's called Sparta and Troy? I guess the world is large, and many men must have the same names. Also cities. Also women. What a good line. This Menelaus is funny. Yeah, sometimes people have the same names. Uh-huh. Not the same fathers, though, often. Still, after all this, he won't accept the fact that he will not find a warm welcome there in Egypt. He decides that no matter what that woman said, the king will surely welcome him, give him food and something to wear, that it's impossible that he won't be given a nice welcome. He's famous, after all. His name is well known, and surely this king will realize that and be his host. He decides he'll wait there for the king and just decide what he should do when he sees him or meets him. If he seems scary, then he'll leave. But if not, He'll ask for all the things he needs. And then... Helen comes back on stage. She doesn't see Menelaus yet. First, she has to tell the audience what she's just learned from Theonoe, the prophetess. That Menelaus isn't dead. Phew. Lucky we have her here to tell us. She is thrilled by this news, of course, relieved and happy and eager to talk about what she's heard. Not only is he alive, but when his trouble is ended, he'll reach her there in Egypt. She finishes her speech, quote, Oh, my husband, when will you come? I'd be so glad to see you. And then she sees him. There's no way this isn't meant to be at least a little comedic, but also the dramatic irony. Oh, she sees him, and she immediately questions who this man is. There's the dramatic irony. She assumes he's working for Theoclymenus, there to force her to marry him. She decides to run from him, as run as fast as she can to the altar of the tomb, hold on to it so that this rough-looking man, this wild-looking man, can't get her. Menelaus, of course, sees her now and equally does not immediately realize who he's looking at, though he has a much better reason, given he believes Helen to be in the cave where he left her. Helen, meanwhile, probably should have recognized her husband. But hey, she's been through a lot and it's been 17 years and he does look haggard as fuck. Still, Menelaus sees this woman coming from the palace, running from him, racing to the altar nearby. He calls out to her, asks her to stop, asks her who she is. He adds, quote, Your looks gave me a shock. In fact, I'm speechless. He is not, in fact, speechless. They begin a back and forth, neither realizing who they're looking at, but both noticing the resemblances to their spouse. 
Menelaus asks who she is, and she replies asking who he is. They won't tell each other, but they are both confused, speaking to the others if they're speaking to themselves. Menelaus says that he's never seen another woman who looks this much like Helen. And Helen says that, quote, it's a god to recognize one's love. They continue. Menelaus asks if she's a Hellene, a Greek, and she tells him that she is, and asks the same. To which he replies, quote, I never saw a woman so like Helen. And she says, and you're like Menelaus. I can't speak. This is finally enough. Menelaus replies, confirming that he is indeed Menelaus. It's all Helen needed to hear. She's relieved, thrilled. She calls out to him. At last he's here. She asks him to come to her, to come to his wife's arms. But it won't be that easy. Helen is, at least momentarily, relieved to have found Menelaus. She's so happy that this dirty, wild-looking man standing before her, shipwrecked on the shores of Egypt, is indeed her husband. The husband she's been longing for, thinking of every moment of the last 17 years. The husband she believed to be dead, that she's been worried about, hoping to see every moment of every day. But he won't come to her. In fact, he snaps at her, telling her to get her hands off of him. Tells her that she is not his wife. She tries to explain, remind him of when they were married, but it's no use. First, he thinks she's a ghost, but she tells him that no, that isn't it. Still, he can't accept it, can't believe that he has two wives. He just left his own wife, Helen, in the cave nearby. This woman m might look like her, but she certainly isn't the same Helen that he just left. God's Greek mythology is timeless, isn't it? Can you just see this, like, in modern fiction movies? This not-so-mistaken identity, the romantic tension that comes from knowing that one person knows the truth while the other is missing out? Knowing that Helen knows that this is the true Helen and that she loves her husband so damn much, but here he is rejecting her, not accepting that it's her, instead calling back to the ghost of her, thinking she's a ghost when the one he thinks is real is the version made of air. And that's essentially what Helen tries to point out to him. She tries to convince him, telling him that she is his wife. Can't he see it? She tells him that there is no other, it's only her. Can't he see his beloved wife standing right before him? But he can't. And it's tough to blame him. He's been fooled these last 17 years, and that isn't easy to accept. But she keeps trying. She tries to explain to him what happened. She tells him that she never went to Troy, that she was brought there to Egypt instead. He concedes that she does look just like his wife, but that's it. Just looks. Quote, Who manufactures living, seeing bodies? The gods, she tells him. The gods did this. She tells him that the gods made him a fake wife, a fake woman, out of thin air. She tells him it was Hera, that she did it so that Paris wouldn't get the real Helen. Then she swapped them, tricked him. Menelaus says, quote, How? So, so you were here and in Troy, too? And Helen replies, Names can be everywhere, a body not. <sighs> Another good one, Euripides. But poor Helen, Menelaus is not convinced. He can't believe that she can be Helen, that there can be two Helens, or rather that the one he's been traveling with for seven years, fighting over for another ten, isn't actually his Helen. A tough pill to swallow, so we can't exactly blame him. Helen has an uphill battle here. She asks him 
if he's leaving her for it, for the emptiness. And he says yes. He tells her, quote, My pain at Troy persuades me. You do not. Again, good line. And then, then a servant comes rushing up to Menelaus, tells him he's come looking for him, sent by his men back at the cave. The man is frantic, breathing heavily, panicked even. Menelaus asks him if they've been robbed by the barbarians. The word barbarian is used a lot here, and it's important. I've said it before and I'll say it now. The word barbarian in ancient Greek just referred to people who were not Greek, who didn't speak Greek. It comes from an onomatopoeia, the sound of languages that weren't Greek, interpreted by Greeks. Of course, in this context too, there is an element of the modern word. The Egyptians here are hateful of Greeks, or at least Theoclymenus is. He is a bad dude attempting bad things, so it's extra interesting used in this context, because it kind of means both. But it still has the connotation of, this is someone who isn't Greek. The servant replies to Menelaus. When asked if they've been robbed by the Egyptians, he says that the word rob is too small, too insignificant to explain what happened. He continues, quote, Your wife is gone in, into the folds of the sky. She's taken. She's invisible. She's hidden in heaven. She has left the holy cave where we were guarding her. She said, Poor Trojans and Greeks who died for me beside the banks of the Scamander, all through Hera's schemes. Paris, you thought, had Helen. He did not. I stayed as long as I was meant to stay, and now I'm going back to the sky, my father, I've served my destiny. He adds, poor Helen got a bad reputation she did not deserve. And then he sees the real Helen, the Helen standing before Menelaus, the Helen who's just begged him to believe her, to accept that she is actually her, that she is his wife, that she's been there in Egypt the whole time, that the other Helen was nothingness, was created of air by the gods, that the other Helen was the fake, the ghost, the Eidolon. Ooh, I'm leaving you waiting. Helen, Helen, Helen. How incredible is this play? How incredible is this Helen? I am just obsessed with this version of her. The Helen who is strong, strong-willed, who doesn't put up with shit and knows that none of this is her fault, but is also empathetic enough to recognize and agonize over the harm caused in her name. The harm caused over a body that looks like hers but isn't hers. It's just so beautiful and fascinating, and I'm now kind of obsessed with this Menelaus, too. He's just so much better than the Menelaus of the Iliad. So much more interesting, so much dweebier for now, at least. <sighs> Fucking Euripides, you guys. Why was he so cool? Beyond the Euripides of it all, to just the idea of the Eidolon, Ghost Helen, is something I want to know so much more about. How could I not? So last week I mentioned how it was the archaic poets to Sycorus who introduced the idea of Eidolon Helen in one of his poems, right? But he and Euripides are not actually the only ones who also place her in Egypt during the Trojan War. It's also a theory by none other than Herodotus. So remember, Herodotus was a so-called historian. I say so-called because he called himself a historian and he definitely tried to be, but he also makes some wild and wacky claims and definitely didn't interrogate his subjects enough, ask follow-up clarification questions, etc. His history is often deeply bizarre and impossible, but it's fun and he was cool. And Herodotus also places Helen in Egypt during the Trojan War, but not because of the Eidolon. He doesn't go so far as to suggest that there's a ghost of her in Troy the whole time just that she isn't actually in Troy at all, that she's detained in Egypt. He names the king at the time, Proteus, and says she was held there by him. His theory is actually that obviously Helen wasn't in Troy during the war because the Greeks and the Trojans wouldn't have bothered to fight a whole 10 years over her if she was actually there. 
He thinks the Trojans would have just given her up long before the 10-year mark. So the obvious explanation is that she wasn't there to be given up. Theories, right? They're awesome. <laughs> anyway, Helen almost certainly wasn't real and the Trojan War almost certainly didn't happen. But I fucking love thinking about all these variations in stories and what they mean for the ancient Greek world. From the Bronze Age all the way until Euripides comes in in classical Greece and is all like, Okay, let's go with the ghost theory and let's make Helen awesome. Next week, of course, more Helen. Let's Talk About Myths Baby is written and produced by me, Liv Albert. Michaela Smith is the Hermes to my Olympians and handles so many podcast-related things, from running the YouTube to creating promotional images and videos to editing and research, and so much more. Stephanie Foley works to transcribe the podcast for YouTube captions and accessibility. The podcast is hosted and monetized by Acast. Thank you all for being cool. I am Liv, and I fucking love Euripides. Like, I just want to be his friend so bad. Can someone make that happen for me, please? Thank you.